How do you know what foods go together? How can you recognize a perfect marriage of ingredients so that your original meals are creative, exciting, and impressive? Well, you need to become a food matchmaker, and that's what we're going to talk about today on the Carefree Cook's Code. I'm Chef Todd Moore, and this is the Carefree Cook's Code every Tuesday live at noon Eastern. Here's our challenge. How can home cooks cook freely with creativity, confidence, and pride while ignoring recipes and still impressing themselves and others with what they cook? Well, the answer is found in becoming empowered with how cooking works, using dependable and repeatable methods of cooking that work for any ingredient, for any diet, and any desire, just like chefs do. And we'll know we've cracked it when everyone sees cooking as an exciting and rewarding way to improve their relationships, their lifestyles, and their health through better food and cooking. This is the Carefree Cook's Code. Welcome back to the Carefree Cook's Code, everyone. Uh, we're here live every Tuesday at noon Eastern. And if you're surprised by this, then you should go to webcookingclasses.com slash live and register for my alert system and you'll never be surprised when we're live again and everyone is joining us hi beverly hi bob uh bonnie's with us betty welcome from florence uh candy is here from eaton ohio carrie from wisconsin and john from north carolina and barbara and grammy and terry and dan and alan and all our friends all our carefree cooks a uh, hundred or so so i can't just read a hundred names but you know what brings us together. I mean, you're aware of it. I don't have to remind you. Okay, I will. We're the carefree cooks, right? We create our own recipes. We bring friends and family together. We learn every time we cook. We define our own cooking style because we practice pro methods and we love our cooking. That's why we're together every Tuesday live at noon Eastern for the Carefree Cooks Code. So I got a lot to get to today because this is a big topic that we're going to have to drill down on really, really deeply. How do you know what foods go together? This is the number one question I get from people, or at least the number one excuse for not cooking. People say, Chef Todd, I really can't cook because I would never know what foods go together. I mean, for goodness sake, if every painter didn't paint because they don't initially know what colors go together, if every writer did not write because they don't know what words go together, if every musician never played an instrument because they aren't sure what chords go together, the world would be vacant of art, of love, of enjoyment, of happiness. It would all be for naught. So have no worries, my friends. You do know what foods go together. You already do. And as usual, I'm here just to help you with a few tips and a few strategies to move you along those lines another step in the journey to becoming truly carefree in your cooking. So, you know, what foods do go together? It, it really seems like a simple question, and it seems like it's answered very simply in any recipe book, right? And this might actually be one of the reasons that recipe books are good. I mean, we all know that they're excellent for listing stuff. They're excellent for making lists of things, but they're not so good with the cooking methods, right? The, and this is usually the part that they leave out. <laughs> How to get this done. Here's the stuff that we want you to do something to but we're really not gonna be clear on how to go about doing that, that's it. But you know, they do offer recipes, suggestions of things that may go together in the author's mind. It's a good place to start. It doesn't have to be the things that go together in your mind, but then again, what if the recipe, what about the recipes that, that don't come out, right? Maybe there are combinations of, of ingredients that, that are good to you, but not good to them or good to them in uh, the recipe book, but then you make them and you go, yeah, I really didn't like that. I mean, what if you, you wanted to omit an ingredient from a recipe? What if you left out the tomatoes in some recipe, short of a tomato sauce, that would be silly, but you want to leave out the tomatoes, you want to leave out the cilantro, you want to substitute parsley, does it ruin the whole thing? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, how do you know how to put together 
items, what's necessary and, and what's not necessary. How do you know what to leave out of written recipes? What can be your own discretion? What can be your own original creation? It all comes down to ideas, okay? Not methods in recipes, but the ideas from the recipes, and that's what we take about them. So what if you were to leave out these ingredients like I'm talking about? Would it ruin everything? And then you ask yourself, well, how do you know? How do you know which foods go together? How do you know what's necessary? How do you know what you can leave out? Which method should I use on what? Which vegetables go with what? What kind of sauce should I put on that? Am I going to insult the ingredients with a certain kind of seasoning? How do I know what kind of garnish? You got to have a plan, right? And there are six categories of consideration that I'm going to share with you today. The first is uh, the six categories that you're going to need to become a food matchmaker. You're going to be able to recognize this perfect marriage of ingredients, of methods, of herbs and spices, of side dishes and sauces that are really going to make your food exciting and outstanding. If you're on the journey to becoming a carefree cook, this is just another tool in your tool belt. I, I mean, it's f great that you can make the best mashed potatoes that you have ever made in your life. And that's part of being a carefree cook too, learning the methods of that. But what I want you not to do now with your greatest mashed potatoes is to put them next to poached chicken. <laughs> you know, think about white and white on the plate. So that's what we're going to work on today. How to really put together a nice plate. And the first match that you have to make, the f most important match, I think, because so many people concentrate, they'll send me, Chef Todd does oregano go with ham, you know, or, or something. Matching the ingredients, everybody focuses there. And really, that will follow. If you do the other five, you'll know which ingredients go with uh, others just in um, based on your past experience, based on what you've eaten in the past. But the first and the most important is matching the cooking method to the ingredient. Look, it, it, no matter what, nothing is going to pair well with a badly cooked item. You know, you have you ever heard of a grilled whole turkey? At Thanksgiving, you ever hear someone say, oh, we grilled our turkey this year and it really was the best ever because it was burned on the outside and raw in the middle. You wouldn't put a whole turkey on a grill, okay? It's just the wrong ingredient. How about something like braised uh, filet of flounder? Well, flounder is so thin and so delicate, why would you have to braise it? It's going to fall apart. And uh, how about sautéed leg of lamb? You know, like big leg of lamb like this and you roll it around in the sauté pan? That That's not going to happen because you know that a sauté method calls for something thinner and tender. You know that grilling calls for pretty much the same. These are both conductive heat cooking methods. They don't cook large items. Braising is for something that's tougher because acids and long, low, and slow cooking acts on the item and tenderizes it. No reason to ever braise fish, you know? Roasting is for larger items because it's convective heat. The, the hot air surrounds the item. Steaming is great for vegetables because you may not want to get color on them. Pan frying is great for items that are breaded because you want the breading to get nice and crunchy. You get the idea? You know, all of these things are things that you wouldn't even consider. They, they seem preposterous when I mention them, right? But there are a lot of people making these mistakes, matching the wrong item to the wrong cooking method. And of course, you are never going to have uh, the results that you want. It doesn't matter what sauce you put on it. It doesn't matter uh, what kind of herbs and spices, because when you cook something poorly, it can't be matched with anything else kind of behind on my slides here. The second is matching aromatics to the protein. Uh, so that you want to ask yourself, do, do carrots go with chicken? Okay, I think they do. Uh, do onions go with pork? Yeah, as a matter of fact, I think onions especially goes with pork. But, you know, uh, you ask yourself, do I think garlic is going to go with this fish? This is the painter-musician analogy that I use all this time. There's no food police that's going to come and tell you, absolutely not, garlic doesn't go with fish, come with us, <laughs> you know, you're under food arrest. If, if you want the garlic to go with the fish, you do the garlic. So the answer is yes, everything goes with everything. Now, does that take a little pressure off? 
Does that, does that make you feel a little better? I'm going to give you permission and say, yes, everything goes with everything. You can't possibly make a mistake. But here's the caveat. Maybe it's how you cook the item that makes it go with everything else and how you prep the item can make it go with everything else. So let me give you a few examples. Um, what if you're grilling chicken? You, you don't want to put little cubes right? Uh, Brunois cubes or medium dice cubes for grilled chicken. You, you're going to want to um, slice chicken into planks maybe for the grill, right? Cut them lengthwise or get large uh, uh, carrots and cut them into coins, rounds that you could put on the grill and grill mark. That would match the method to the chicken that you're grilling. If you're sauteing chicken, that's when you can probably do your uh, brunoise carrot or your medium dice carrot, things like that. This, the next thing is matching sauces to the proteins and the aromatics. So You've decided that you're making chicken with carrots and garlic. What kind of sauce is going to go with that? I, I don't know that I would put a barbecue sauce, right? Barbecue sauce with carrots and, and garlic on chicken? Eh, I don't know. Garlic and the barbecue sauce might not work well. Um, I don't know that I would use like a Asian plum sauce. I, I don't know. Maybe a sweeter sauce. You know, so you start thinking, do I want it creamy? Am I going to do like a cream sauce? I think garlic and a bechamel uh, with some Parmesan cheese, uh, oregano on chicken. That sounds like an Alfredo. So in my mind, those things kind of go together right? Sausage, sausage, not sausage, sauces should complement the flavor of the item without hiding it, without disguising it, without making it too big or heavy, right? So often uh, you're going to uh, consider something that is a jus, which might be a thinner item. So you might do like beef broth for beef, um, or you might thicken it. And the thickening agent really matters a lot less than the flavor of the liquid that you are going to thicken. You get the idea? So beef broth for beef dishes, that's obvious, right? Seafood uh, broth or a, a shrimp uh, a stock that you would use for poaching or steaming fish or making the sauce out of the fish. But, you know, you also have an opportunity to swap it up here. Um, you might uh, use a velote instead of a stock, which is a thickened liquid. So you take your stock, your flavorful liquid, and you thicken it with a roux. That's going to stick to the food a little better, and you're able to flavor that better. It's a lot easier to add seasonings to a thickened liquid than it is to a thinner liquid. Generally, you kind of have to make a tea. Um, and if you've heard me in the five skills class talk about macerating, macerating flavors into the liquid, um, with a stock, you need to do that longer. With a sauce, it seems to go much, much quicker. Uh, you know, a cornstarch slurry is a quick way to thicken a liquid as well that you can match the sauce. But you can also break the rules because one of my favorite things here, downtown Baltimore, Maryland, is Maryland crab soup. If, if you've ever had a true Maryland crab soup, it's like a vegetable soup with a tomato base and crab, but it uses beef broth. And I would never really think about putting a beef broth um, into a fish soup, but it, it gives you that contrast that's so incredible. So it's another one of those things. What goes with what? Follow the rules if you want, or learn the rules well enough that you can break them like an artist. And you've heard me and Pablo Picasso say that a few times, right? Chicken broth replaces fish stock quite well. Chicken broth is relatively neutral in flavor, and you can put that in a lot of places. The fourth thing, as when we talk about what goes with what, and we talked about this just a few weeks ago, is herbs and spices and the difference of flavoring versus seasoning because flavoring changes the overall flavor of the food, but seasoning highlights the natural flavor of the food. Uh, so when you consider how you use these things, then you have to start thinking about herbs versus spices. And I'm going to give you some examples uh, in just a minute. When to use each in cooking. So herbs are generally the leaves of the plants. They're delicate. And I've said this before. You've heard this in my five skills class. If you pinch a basil leaf between your fingers and then smell your fingers, your fingers will smell like basil. And it's kind of the way you tell the difference between cilantro and flat leaf parsley. 
You know, when you go to the store, those two look almost exactly alike, but squeeze them and smell your fingers, you smell a totally different. So leaves have active oils in them. They're added later in the cooking. When I do a chiffonade of basil, which is a ribbon, long ribbon cut, and sprinkle it on my pizza, I put it on the pizza when it comes out of the oven. Just the residual heat of the pizza is enough to, to release that aromatic quality of it. But spices, they're generally the seeds, the stems uh, of plants. They're dried and ground and they're used like tea. Earlier in the cooking, you want to macerate the flavor of seasonings into your liquids. Uh, it's a little bit more like tea. Herbs you use as garnish. Herbs you put later. But how do you choose which? You know, Chef Todd, yeah, okay, fine. Herbs versus season, flavoring versus seasoning. Herbs versus spices. When you use them in the cooking, but you still haven't answered my question, which is, which ones? How do I know? Well, look, what I always tell people is to create uh, seasonings to the item. So it's really, really simple. If, if you just kind of open your mind a little bit, if you go into a, a kitchen zen kind of state, because if you sniff thyme, sage, maybe some tarragon, uh, uh, you know, open your jar of thyme, put it under your nose and sniff it and close your eyes, go into a Zen state. And, and what does it remind you of? I'm going to close my eyes right now. Pretend I sniffed some thyme. Thanksgiving, turkey, poultry, chicken, thyme and, and sage are on my poultry team. So if you've got your spices in your spice rack alphabetically, this does you no good. Nobody's cooking chicken and goes, hmm, I really need an A. <laughs> you know, uh, something that starts with an E would taste great here. No, you go to your teams. So poultry team, I use thyme, I use sage, I often use tarragon in chicken salad for beef. Think about beef. Think about that roast that grandma used to do. It's got rosemary. It's got thyme, uh, maybe a bay leaf as well. Put those things, three things together. They're your beef team. How about fish and shellfish? I love dill. I love parsley. I love citrus kind of things. High notes in it. That would be my fish team. Or you create an ethnic profile. And I know it's been in the news with police departments. I'm not referring to that at all. I'm referring to cooking. And this is allowed in your kitchen is creating an ethnic profile. So same thing. Close your eyes. Go into a Zen type state. Open the jar of oregano. Put it under your nose and tell me that doesn't smell like a pizza place. Uh, I had a childhood pizza place when I was a kid. Gino's Pizzeria in Limbrook, New York. And every time I smell oregano... It takes me back to Gino's Pizza in Limbrook. Uh, basil, same thing. Garlic, they're going to be your Italian team. If you put cumin together with coriander and cilantro, you're going to have a Mexican team, a Latin team, a South American team, that kind of thing. If you smell cumin and coriander, it's going to remind you of tacos. It's going to remind you of Taco Bell. Uh, so th the next thing that we need to consider is why I have a white screen there. Oh, for goodness sake. How to, did I lose it somehow? My slides. All right, we talked about the first match. We talked about the second, the proteins, the aromatics, the herbs and spices. Uh, this is where I was. Ah, and I lost my slides. So <laughs> the, the next thing that we want to talk about is side dishes. All right, so now that we've been able to match the method to the ingredient, I just got a comment this morning. Somebody told me that they tried the nine steps in the basic saute method, but they were really disappointed because their steak, which was three inches thick, was burned on the outside and almost raw in the middle. It was 130 degrees on the outside and 60 degrees in the middle. And this person didn't understand why that was because uh, saute is not meant for that. So you're matching the ingredient to the item. You are matching the aromatics that would go with it. Um, like unless you're doing Asian, I wouldn't do uh, ginger on uh, something that was really delicate like a fish or shrimp. So you're matching the aromatics. You're matching the sauces to the item. You're matching the herbs and spices to the item. You're matching the sauce to the item. Now it comes time for the rest of the plate and the side dishes. 
So your side dishes should never overpower the entree, okay? And what I mean by this is your protein product or the prime thing on your plate is what you want everyone to see. So if you're doing a really delicate white fish, again, say a, a flounder, nice delicate sauteed flounder, I wouldn't put a big mound of au gratin potatoes on there or uh, a, a nice delicate poached flounder, or poached shrimp or, or fish, and then a big pile of cheesy risotto. You know, that's really heavy. When you're adding something delicate as the main, try and get something delicate as the side as well. Uh, you know, those all gratins, those heavy cheesy dishes, they're probably better for the roast beef. They're better for the leg of lamb. Now, when we talked about plate presentation uh, of two weeks ago, I think, we also talked about the contrast of shapes and textures. So if you're ha serving spaghetti, let's say, long spaghetti noodles, don't, don't put julienne chicken in with spaghetti. Don't put long strips necessarily of peppers. If you want contrast, I would use cubed. I would use a, a brunoise or small, medium, large dice. Uh, why do spaghetti and meatballs go so well together, right? It, it's not spaghetti and meat sticks. It's spaghetti and meatballs because one is long and the other is round. Um, let's change it up a little bit. Which would have a better presentation on a plate? Matching the side dish to the main is what we're talking about. Um, if your main dish was meatballs, would you serve them with beans? Right? Round and round. Would you serve them with a little uh, those little pearl onions? You know, that's a lot of round on your plate. Throw some Israeli couscous on there, and you really got a, a marbles, <laughs> a marbles plate, it basically is what you're looking down on. The sixth item in becoming a food matchmaker is the garnishing. Okay, the garnish should always communicate to the diner. Don't ever garnish with something that is not an ingredient in the dish. Uh, you don't want to confuse someone by putting a slice of lemon on something that has no lemon in it. Uh, don't put parsley, the sprig of parsley, that lonely sprig of parsley on something that doesn't have any parsley in it. But you are able to communicate positive things. So if you're doing something that has peanut butter in it, peanut sauce, or a potential allergy, garnish that with peanuts for sure, to demonstrate to someone that's what's in there. Or there's cilantro, and people hate cilantro. Garnish it with a sprig of cilantro so people know that uh, that it's in there. So keeping all these things in mind, really there are no rules. I mean, it, it comes down to that if it's good to you, it's good. But there are a few guidelines. So when you're thinking about in general, I've just given you six different steps, but let me try and bring this together in general. In general, when you're thinking about complementary flavors, and this is the way that I do it, I think about it kind of like music. I think about high notes and low notes, all right? High and low. La, la, right? High notes and low notes, not only in music, uh, but in cooking as well, and not only in cooking, but in painting. Think about if you looked at a painting that was a very bright yellow, it had a lot of oranges. You know, it was a, a sunset, a painting of a dramatic sunset. That's very bright. It's obvious. What about a, a very dark period when a famous painter goes through his, his blue period or his dark period and you look at these paintings and you can barely make out the shadows and the ghouls that are in there and, and so on. And it's very dark. Well, this can be expressed in food as well. And anytime I'm trying to figure out what goes with each other, I think about high notes, high notes and no notes, <laughs> low notes and high notes. All right, let me give you an idea. I, I wish I used to do this class in my cooking school where we tasted the thing. So I'm going to need your imagination. Are you with me? Can I, can I get some imagination out of this? All right, so we're going to close our eyes again because you don't need to see me. I, my slides broke. Close your eyes and think about lemon juice a touch of lemon juice on your tongue, all right? And yeah, you might squint up a little bit. Oh, lemon juice. All right, now think about something like Worcestershire sauce or uh, soy sauce, right? Very muddy, very deep. Think about a drop of Worcestershire sauce on your tongue. Mm. You'd make a different face, right? Lemon would be, ooh, Worcestershire sauce would be, ah, uh, right? Think about um, garlic and onion, the, the earthiness uh, of garlic and onion versus like a, a carrot and a parsnip. You know, think about root vegetables versus herbs. Think about a, a parsnip and a carrot 
versus um, cilantro or parsley, just be because we've been talking about it. Think about things that grow in the dirt versus things that grow up on the branches of the tree. Like just, they're inherently contrast. A potato versus an apple. You know, a, a carrot versus a, a peach. Dramatically different, right? So you can start to think of these things physically as high notes up in the tree versus low notes down in the ground, right? Uh, think about just different herbs. I, I mentioned tarragon before. Tarragon tastes like licorice. You know, tarragon has a very heavy kind of licorice. To me, it's a very low note. But when I think about dill, dill is a very clean, light, high note. So this is a topic that, that a good cook really will never answer for themselves because they will always find something new that goes with something else. Think about this, all right? Here's the contradiction in this entire question of what goes with what. Like I said at the beginning here, people tell me, Chef Todd, I can't cook because I don't know what goes with what. But yet the new chef is lauded because he found a new combination of ingredients. Oh my goodness. It's like my friend, uh, like my friend uh, Michel in Barcelona. Do you remember when I was in Spain? Uh, any of you that have seen my uh, international food finds a uh, uh, web class. Uh, when I went and visited Michelle in Barcelona, he was doing fried shrimp. They call them crispy prawns. Fried shrimp on basil ice cream. He's insane, right? You would think that Michelle doesn't know how to cook. Who puts fried shrimp on ice cream? Who makes basil ice cream for that matter? But we're not going to go there. Michelle's a genius, okay? And he's not even a chef. He's like an engineer or something. He's just a really creative guy. And he will tell you, I don't know how to cook that well. The, the chefs I hire do, but I know how to come up with these inspirations. So there is the contradiction. If you think that you can't cook because you don't know what goes together, the greatest chefs in the world are throwing stuff together that shouldn't go together. So does that give you license or not? You want to go put ice cream and fried shrimp together? Go do it. There's no rule. There's nobody going to tap you on the shoulder and say it can't be done. You know, all I care about is that you cook. All I care about is that you cook your own food at home. I don't care what combinations. So if you spend the rest of your life searching for the perfect answer to this question, good, good for you. I hope you never find the answer because that means you will constantly be putting things together. You will constantly be adding new ingredients. Last time I did this, this time I'm gonna add a scoop of this. Last time it was a high note, I made it very lemony and citrusy. This time I'm gonna make it very low note. I'm gonna use parsnips and carrots and Worcestershire sauce and very low things because if, if you get thoughtful, all right, if you think, really start to think about your use of ingredients, you taste them before you cook with them. You, you, you taste them as you cook. You really think about it. You're going to have a catalog. You're going to have a food memory catalog in your mind, and you're going to be able to bring it out another time because you know it's going to be the perfect complement to whatever you're working on now. I mean, really taste a carrot. Okay, I'm, I'm not just, all right, carrot, yum, yum, yum. Taste it. Is it sweeter than the last carrot you tasted? Is it blander than the last carrot you tasted? Taste your onions, the onions you're getting now. Are they more pungent? Are they tart? Are they sweeter? Look at your paints. Listen to your notes. Ask a painter how much green paint to use, right? They won't know. So how much green paint did you use? I have no idea. Ask them how they knew where to put the yellow. They don't know and they just know because they tried it before and they failed. And then they tried it again and they failed. And then they tried it again and they succeeded. And this is your path. The way you marry foods together, the way you match the cooking methods to the ingredients, the way you consider the complements, the way you consider the contrast, the flavors, this is all your artistic expression of cooking. This is your path to becoming a carefree cook. And nobody else can tell you what goes well together in your kitchen? Only your mouth can tell you that.
That's what's important. And that's the lesson for today. Um, hey, it's time for Dish of the Week. When I see the things that go together, uh, the first thing I saw was Stephen. Uh, he put fried chicken, mashed potatoes, corn, and a biscuit. <laughs> Can't get any better go together than that. There's a comfort food for you. Nita uh, did a nice marinated lamb, and she did just what I was talking about, the, the root vegetables, uh, diced shallots, fresh rosemary and thyme on lamb, mint, uh, carrots, turnips, tremendous. Uh, Charlie was cooking lamb this week also, and the thing that I thought was such a great matchmaker was he braised the root vegetables that went with it. Cooked them for a long period of time, flavored them with a flavorful liquid. Uh, Deb was doing ham steaks. She puts pineapple on ham. There you go, there, right? There's a good match. Used a cilantro sauce, uh, green beans. Uh, she had a cornbread dressing. That goes great with ham as well. Uh, James did a pulled pork sandwich with coleslaw, baked beans, and a pickle. A, B, C, what goes better than pulled pork, coleslaw, baked beans, and a pickle? And if you know someone that would like to become a food matchmaker that needs to put these six categories together and really start making their plates absolutely beautiful and harmonious in every way, like this video, please. That means Facebook says it's great, it's valuable, and needs to share it with someone else and share the video with someone. And if you want to start your own journey toward becoming truly free in the kitchen, go to fiveforksguide.com. Get my free immediate download, The Five Forks to Carefree Cooking, and you can become a carefree cook as well. Hey, everyone. We'll see you again next Tuesday at noon for the Carefree Cooks Code. Chef Todd Moore reminding you that there's a method to your cooking success. Bye, everyone.